In a way, I'm really thankful for this opportunity. Why? Because, uh, um, well, I am in a way engaged with photography and photography theory, so it's always kind of a, a great to read and uh, uh, ponder on the thoughts of philosophers that deal with photography. And also, uh, it's kind of a great opportunity to revisit again one of the most famous photographs, uh, at least for those who are dealing uh, with photography theory, and that is the photograph of uh, Alexander Gardner, uh, who is Spain, this photograph. That photograph was published in Camera Rosida, and it's also a part of the Rancière article, The Pensive Image. Okay, um, so let's just revisit again what Barth has had to say about this image. Of course, this is Louis Payne, Louis Powell Payne. Payne was his nickname. Barth, Barth states, in 1865, young Louis Payne tried to assassinate Secretary of State V. H. Seward. Alexander Gardner photographed him in his cell. So, yeah waiting to be hanged. The photograph is uh, handsome, is handsome, as is the boy, that is the studium. But the punctum is, he's going to die. So we need to move forward, he's going to die. And Barth goes on, I read at the same time, this will be and this has been. This will be and this has been. I observe with horror an anterior future of which that is the stake. By giving me the absolute past of the pose, ours, the photograph tells me the death in the future. What pricks me is the discovery of this equivalence. And then suddenly Barth in his, his description lapses towards another thing, towards the memory of his mother's image. In front of the photograph of my mother as a child, I tell myself, she's going to die. I shudder, like Winnicott's psychotic patient over a catastrophe which has already occurred. And that universal conclusion from, ah, it's already occurred, sorry. Well, what Bart does, you know, suddenly the image of his mother, uh, which we actually never do see in Camera Lucida, which is present in a way that it is always absent, suddenly pops in the logic of his explanation. Okay. And, Suddenly, Barth, Barth makes something that's kind of a particular. He, from this image, he will generalize on all the images in Camera Lucida and the photography in general. It's a kind of a universal conclusion. Every, uh, in every photograph, the punctum, you know, what pierces is the time. Is this, this will be and this has been, this uh, future past tense, past future tense. So, um, in order to understand a little bit more about this picture, you know, and the way Barth explains it, uh, we need to understand, you know, his separation between studium and punctum. Studium on one hand is basically, let's say, kind of a combination of uh, denotation and connotation, as it was developed previously in Barth's the third meaning. And punctum is also kind of a derivation from what Barth, Barth was explaining in the third meaning, which is the third meaning in, third, in the article, third meaning, the third meaning was something that blunts the obvious reading of, uh, of uh, the connotation. And uh, here in Camera Lucida, he introduces punctum, you know, something that pierces us. So we have you know, third meaning, something that blunts, and here something that pierces us. So that's one uh, separation. And um, a lot has been written about Barth, and there is a wonderful book, Photography Degree Zero, edited by Jeffrey Batchen, where you can find numerous articles. It was published, I think, a few years ago, so it's quite recent. And Jeffrey Batchen kind of, uh, in one paragraph, neatly summarizes the thing. So Barth states that very often the punctum is a detail, that is the starting point. And then sometimes this feels, but the punctum can fill the whole picture, as here, you know. It's the time. And in the French edition, that, uh, that's the Jeffrey Batchen remark, um, the punctum is sometimes called the supplement. You know, it's an addition. Uh, and this uh, you know, punctum is, of course, precariously positioned between active and passive reading, between activity and passivity. 
and whether or not is it, it is triggered, it is an addition. It is what I add to photograph and what is nonetheless already there. So that's kind of important what I add, but it's already there. And uh, finally, Bart uh, makes kind of a uh, conclusion out of this. Uh, I know now that there exists another punctum, another stigmatum de uh, than the detail. This new punctum, which is no longer a form, but of intensity, is time, the lesser rating emphasis of the noeme. That has been its pure representation. So, and uh, of course, Bart, Bart goes on and clearly states that this punctum, more or less blurred beneath the abundance and the disparity of contemporary photographs, is vividly legible in historical photographs. There is always a defeat of time in them. So but what is he basically saying, okay, this image in particular you know, allows me to see this, but this punctum, which is time, is present in all of the photographs. So from particular to total in a way. Okay, so let's go now on uh, Rancière reading, which is from the pensive image. Uh, uh, he writes about it in the pensive image and in the article What Medium Can Mean. Um, there are subtle differences between the texts, but not that crucial in a way. In the pensive image, there is simply more about the notion of pensiveness and more detailed analysis of the photo itself. So, from the uh, what medium can mean, sorry. From what medium can mean, uh, we can read. The punctum in its supposed immediateness is in fact constituted by the conjunction of two things. On one hand, a knowledge about the, his, uh, about the history of a figure, and on the other, the very texture of the photograph, its coloration is indicative of the fact that it is an old photo from the past. Well, okay, so we need to do that. We need to create this old photo for the past, you know, sepia tone. Uh, a photo of someone who, in any case, is already dead as we view it. Okay. In the pensive image, uh, um, Rancière states that in the 1980s, you know, the time of publishing of Camera Lucida, we can for sure say he is dead. Okay. So Rancière in the pensive image um, tells us that Bart's point is similar to what he calls an ethical regime, regime of the images. The depiction that ensures the permanent sensible presence of the individual like in a classical sculpture. Um, because Bart writes in the century where, you know, in a way, delight in the images and art uh, is, we, we delight in images in art not because they are inhabited by the souls or our ancestor, but because of them themselves, Bart needs to turn the depiction of the ancestor in the punctum of the dead into emotion into, with a certain intensity. And Rancière continues. Bars basically perf performs a short circuit between the past of the image and the image of the dead. But this, in a way, actually blurs the char char characteristical features of the photograph, the, feature the features of indeterminacy, in a way, also uncertainty. So, and now, the singularity of the photograph, this photograph, of course, we are constantly talking about this photograph, don't forget that. The singularity of the photograph in truth rests on the three forms of indeterminacy. First one is kind of the painter style, artistic style, art, artistic style of posing, it's posed. We don't know if this is the result of a photographer's selection or not. Nerencier also mentions the lines and dots on the wall. We don't know if uh, the photographer merely recorded the lines and dots on the wall or he has deliberately accentuated them. So you know, we don't know, it's just simple recording or there is a, some extra photographic intention here at play. And then second one, second indeterminacy, it's the work of time. The texture of a photograph is marked by time, by his close and his intense gaze uh, that can easily belong to our time. 
So in a way, we have uh, the work of time. It's a, on, on one side, it's a textural photograph. I'm sorry, but here the sepia tone is not coming into play as I intended to. But we have this, uh, the old style photograph, you know, the, the sepia, the, the uh, brown tone that reminds us that it is old photograph. And then, you know, in a way, we see this contemporary gaze, contemporary uh, pose, even contemporary dress. Uh, so there's an inter indeterminacy between them. Okay, and the third one. Even though we know he's going to die, and why we cannot dis... Uh, and why he's going to die? We know because, you know, Bart and uh, we know that he's waiting to be executed. Uh, we know he was uh, condemned because he was part of the plot uh, to assassinate uh, um, Abraham Lincoln. And the thing is, we cannot discern from the image the reason for his murder. So we don't know what his intentions were for the murder uh, from the image itself nor can we discern from the image the feelings that he might have in the light of his imminent death. So, Ranciere, this is kind of a conclusion, the pensiveness of the image could be defined as a knot between these all three indeterminacies. Contrary to Bart, the pensiveness ar arises from the impossibility of combining the two images into one, the socially determined image of the condemned to death and the image of a young man of somewhat inquisitive indifference, staring at the point that we cannot see. And then, you know, uh, a bit more on, Rancière states, the photograph of Louis Payne does not belong to the field of art, but it helps us understand the other photographs that are deliberately artworks, or those which are offering an, uh, us the same, uh, the same, at the same time the social connotation and aesthetical indeterminacy. So in a way, it's, I would say the procedure is kind of similar like in Bart. You know, Bart would say, okay, although this historical image uh, shows me you know, the time as a punct, you know, I can uh, sense that, but, and I can then think ev of every photograph as being like this one. The same is in Rosier, you know, I can, even though this is not art, you know, I can consider this as art, or, uh, you know, I can consider it as any other image that plays with so, uh, indeterminacy between, between social connotation and indeterminacy of aesthetics, okay, aesthetical indeterminacy. So, but of course, you know, um, this image was cropped. Huh, this is just, this is the original image. The full image shows far more information and far more detail. We can see more surrounding, and we can easily imagine this really to be taken as uh, it is by now established on USS, USS Monitor Saugus. It's a, it was taken on a ship, it was not taken in a cell. And it was a steam warship docked in the New York Harbor. The ter uh, so we can. Okay, just, this is the information about the image, you know, we have this Library of Congress, I'm just showing this to you because it seems kind of a, as it would be unnecessary to show this, but I love this because it's all the information gathered about the image, or all this factual information that you can get on, in the library. Okay, and this is the USSS monitor Saugus, and we can see, you know, this uh, pointer, we can see the whiteness that you know, we can see on the top of the image, and okay, you can't see a lot, but. but this is another image which is kind of interesting. It was done at the same time, and uh, the reporters were actually denied the access to prisoner, but Alexander Gardner was uh, allowed. And on April 27, Gardner began taking photographs of those that were caught, because uh, Louis Payne was not the only one tried and executed. One by one, each prisoner was brought on the deck and photographed in few positions. Gardner took far more photographs of Pavel than anyone else. Pavel obliged Gardner by posing seated, standing, with and without restraints, and modeling with the overcoat that he'd worn on the night of the Seward attack. So basically, what we see here is a kind of a playful staging act, you know. Pavel is dressed as he was dressed on the night of the attack. 
stage photography. Once more photographs were done at the time. But there were other photographs as well, and that were photo uh, photographs done uh, near um, in the background of the turret itself. So, was the pose the result of the photographer's interventions, his intentions? We still don't know, but judging from the playful staging of Louis Spain with coat, you know, and with the hat, and judging by the various shots uh, against the background of the third, we could be in, uh, at least justify to be inclined to say that the pose is the result of the photographer's intentions. So, you know, kind of one indeterminacy would be gone for this narrative. And then when we think about the gaze, the gaze of Louis Spain. One needs to consider that Pavel attempted suicide uh, a couple of days prior to this photo by, being, uh, by banging his head against the wall, and that all the prisoners from that day were forced to wear uncomfortable, soft, claustrophobic, padded canvas head covers, and most of the time they were locked below decks. decks. So basically, you know, at the time of photographing, that was a kind of a rare occasion for them to go and see the daylight and to be on top of the ship and to be photographed. Uh, they were actually wearing the head max 24 hours a day, soft cushion max, just eyes and, and uh, ears and mouth open. Okay, so we can easily imagine the conflict between, you know, glimpsed freedom, intense desire of staring at the horizon on one hand, and the forceful photographer's interventions that would like to discipline and control the gaze it's, itself. Look this way, look th that way. You can imagine you come, you, know, you want to see the horizon, suddenly you have a kind of a discipline control situation where a photographer uh, <laughs> tells you, you know, how to act, how to behave. So maybe this is kind of indeterminacy there. So both account, in both account, in Barts and Arsene, they play, they also play with, or at least hint on the waiting to be executed, the inevitability of the death, the immediacy of death, the hanging itself. You know, he is in cell, he's waiting to be hanged. But as we stated before, the images were taken on 27th of April, let's say probably, you know, probably a day or two from this date, but that's it. The case is uh, that most probably Louis Spain knew quite well what awaits him, that he's going to be executed. But the trial had not started yet. The trial had started only on the 9th of May. So this was, the photograph was actually done prior to the trial. And the verdict was passed at the end of June, signed by President Johnson on July. And execution take, takes place on 7th of July. So, both Bart and Transia, they, play, they play with this tension, you know, this imminent immediacy of execution. And let's go back to the color of the image. One cannot but to ask, did Transia hold in hands the actual negative, the print? Did he observe the image for the first time while reading Bart Camera Lucida? And was it first edition? Was it colored brown in the first edition of Camera Lucida in French language? In Slovenian edition, it's black and white. I think that has a lot to do with the, uh, the state of our publishing. Black and white it simply costs less. Uh, you know, because material texture plays an important part in his explanation. You know, it's a con conflict short circuit between the historical knowledge, sentenced to death, and the coloration, the sign of an old photograph of the times that has had long passed. And now, you know, to, to contribute a little bit more to the indeterminacy of this whole narrative that I'm actually <laughs> um, telling, uh, in Slovenian Im image of the pensive image uh, in the emancipated spectator, the image of Louis Spain is presented as a whole, uh, huh, like this. So it's not presented as it was presented in camera Lucida. So and actually, I don't know how Rancière's photograph in French edition of the pensive image was, you know, it's open to speculation. 
And uh, I think one of the reasons is because it's readily available, available in the Library of Congress where it's presented as a whole. So let's think about uh, the contemplative gaze, this looking. Um, I think it takes a lot of time to appreciate an image to an extent that it becomes pensive, or for that matter, for punctum to pierce us. It must be considered, in a way, in a solitude. It must, it must be con con considered secluded from the others. The act of viewing must be, in a way, intimate. It requires a ponderous gaze, attention, and intention. In short, a certain circumstances need to come in play. Special conditions of looking and special intent of the observer. Sometimes the intention structures the circumstances, and sometimes it is the opposite. But not all of the uh, of the looking of the image, the act of viewing is performed in this way. Uh, we can even say and you know, be quite sure about it that only a few images out of billions are ever looked with such an intense and intentful gaze. And such punctum and such pensiveness you know, belong to only a few observer and a few observed photographs. Now, it is this, this kind of viewing, it is reserved for a special, exceptional cultural, social situation. So, the same procedure that Rancière notices in Bart, Bart, Bart's reading of the, the, the image of Louis Spain are present in the Rancière's reading as well. So, in a way, we are basically giving instruction how to read the image in order to desire theoretical effect to come through. Or rather, we are presented with a text image. We are presented with already with a representation. This is one example of this representation, which we should consider as a particular image, a photograph. So it's kind of a twist. We are presented with a representation, and yet, in a way, I sense that we are supposed to think that, that it's all about the photograph. So in case of uh, Barth, the punctum is time. In case of Rancière, the pensiveness, which is in the terminacy of tension between three modes of representation or function image, the mark of identity, the purposeful artistic pose, the mar and the marks of mechanical recording, if you remember the dots and the lines. But as opposed to Barth, he addresses Rancière, addresses the intentions of photographer, mm, but in a way merely fleetingly in passing. He states that we don't know if the pose is a product of photographer's intention or not. And if we don't know if he has merely recorded the line and dots on the wall or he has deliberately accentuated them. You know, it's a kind of a sleight of hand stating the, I would say, the known unknowns. Here we could be almost tempted to see a kind of revitalization of a modernist fixation on the author's intentions, especially because it's kind of a, it's so, it's so subtle. So, so, sleight of hand. Why? Well, there are so many other uh, factors that we don't know, you know known unknowns. Place, time, all the particularities of the photo session, uh, and then singling out the intentions of photographer. Why? And I think it's rather extremely important to understand that Arancia is actually not thinking or talking, writing of the photograph of Alexander Gardner at all, but of Barth's photograph. It can be said that he has a particular image text Barth with Spain representation in mind, a representation of a representation of a representation, but it's rather unclear if he's aware of that or not. So the same as it's, uh, it is said about, um, uh, the same what Rancière says about the author of photographer, you know, um, we don't know if the pose was selected by the photographer. In the next image, in the pensive image, he, dis uh, he d discusses uh, Walker Evans, and he says, we don't know what Walker Evans had in mind when he took the shot. And he said about the pensive image as well. We don't know what or which image Rancière had in mind when he wrote the text. It is and it is not a photograph. Maybe it's just a page in the book. How much time do we have? Ah, I have just, I think I will speed up a little bit. So, <clears throat> well, just let's consider this intention, you know, the taking of a photograph. Uh, Bart is particularly unconcerned with the condition of the act of photography itself. And they say, in you know, reading photography, creating, taking, is considered in the meaning of author's intentions, the intent. 
as if taking a photograph um, that would be you know limited to would be an activity that is you know done by the photographer and could be understood only as that. We must understand you know the, the, the situation of taking of images photographing as a particular technological, cultural, social act. Because when we reduce it only to photographs' attention, of course, you know, a lot of meaning goes uh, by us. For example, what about the intentions of the government? Nothing is said about why the government, for the first time, allowed public execution to be photographed. Rancier do mentions that, but he does not go into details. Maybe a photographer was simply hired to do a job. And from the images, it seems that he was hired to photograph the whole event, not just the Louis Payne. So, did the photographer had in mind the whole of the event, and not just a particular image? So that the famous Louis Payne image was taken as a part of a larger horror, a series of image. This is how it was in English edition. And yes, of course, you know, the day of execution, we have the series of images. That one is really, it, it shows it's a bit of shaking. I can just imagine Gardner because he was using large format camera and that was, he really needed to, to catch the moment of the drop. So, it's a bit shaky image. The other ones are really clear. This is adjusting the ropes for the hanging hanging hooded bodies of the four conspiracies, crowd departing, guards only in yard. Okay. And of course, you know, we have a few images more that, that are done basically uh, in a cart visit way, you know. And we can clearly see here, you know, that this look was not meant uh, was actually meant to be sold, you know, his fierceful look. He was told, if you ask me, you know, I have, <laughs> kind of, a, I would say he was told to look like that so they can make cart with it and sell them. Pain, alias Wood, alias uh, Hal. So, okay. So, in a way, Louis Payne was also a celebrity, of course, you know, he was observed in July. he was, in a way, a celebrity, so the pictures did sell. I don't know. Uh, Victor Bergen once said that maybe um, the review of Camera Lucida as a work for fi fiction is yet to be written. Of course, it ne needs to be, it is a fiction. Well, I'm not that sure about the pensive image. You know. It's a work of fiction, work of theory. That's a question to be asked. Mm, okay, I'll just conclude um, not exactly with a quote, but uh, almost a quote. John Tack, in his not yet published article presented last year in uh, the conference on photography, um, had a presentation titled Everything and Nothing Photography Revisited. I love the title, Everything and Nothing, because what we are doing here, what we are, you know, what I try to actually to convey is everything and nothingness of photography. He states that the repeated institutional effort to make meaning arrive in the police file, in the court of law, in a geological survey, in the historical textbook, in the museum, place, you know, museum, also art institution, art, maybe even art here, would hardly be so insistent or so violent if the photograph were not, uh, photograph, photography, were, photograph were not always at once overproductive of meaning and as nothing but the stain in the dirt, at the same time inadequate to deliver the desired me message. All saying too much and too little, more than is wanted and less than is desired. Actu uh, effi effectively undoing the notion that meaning in the photograph ever arrives in its fullness or can ever be exhaustively defined. And now to the, 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 the final point which I need to stress. This was kind of an example of this classical, I would say it's a cl classical thinking of photography, which I'm really, I, I'm not engaging it quite often, so I was kind of really happy to have this, um, this um, um, opportunity to do that. Why? And it's how tech continues, it's really important, you know. The meaning never arrives, okay. But then he suddenly discussed about the drones and the drone warfare. 
and the representation away from binocular and visual representation. You know? And he says, yeah, but the payload does. So the power <laughs> of photograph, the payload, you know, the warhead arrives, even though the representation is never transferred into this kind of visual binocular representation. So I would say, you know, if we really need, that's my, my position, you know, dealing with photographies, we need to deal it, you know, in uh, kind of a where it is and where it is happening and where it is re relevant. Rancière also discusses a lot about the power of, power of photography in other article, um, unbearable image. Uh, he goes through the whole um, excourse of several photographers and artists, Alfredo Jar and um, who else? Uh, ah, okay, we have Alfredo Jar and then Claude Lanzmann and then he discusses the controversy between uh, Claude Lanzmann and uh, Gerard, Gerard Weissmann on one hand and um, George D. Hoover on, on the other hand uh, about the unbearable, unbearable image of horror and war, etc. And he ends up with, the, with another excursion of, you know, he concludes with the pensive image which is a classical documentary after a mad image. You know, but my position is we need to think of photography dif differently. <laughs> You know, we think we need to really think a bit away about this, uh, away from the visual uh, representation you know, itself. We need to think, think it as an act of photography. You know, it's not just photography; it's also photographing. Um, okay, let's. I will conclude with that. Okay, thank you. <laughs>